All right, guys. Um, so today we will continue with our discussion of antimicrobial agents. Um, we'll talk specifically about fluoroquinolones, sulfonamides, and then some antibiotics that are specifically for urinary tract infections, so urinary antiseptics um, like macrobid, for example. Okay, um, so we'll start by talking about the fluoroquinolones. Um, if you look at the bottom down here, you will see um, some of the different fluoroquinolone antibiotics. The first three are the most commonly used. Um, ciprofloxacin, which is generic for cipro, levofloxacin, which is generic for levoquin, and moxifloxacin, which is generic for avalox, um, I believe. Um, these three are the most commonly used agents. There are other agents, gemifloxacin, ofloxacin, um, but these first three are used the most. So all of the fluoroquinolones um, work by inhibiting topoisomerase enzymes in the bacteria, um, specifically topoisomerase 4 in DNA gyrase. Um, <clears throat> but they inhibit with these enzymes, and these enzymes are necessary for um, bacterial replication. So you know, inhibiting them interferes with DNA ligation, like the two DNA strands attaching to each other. So they can't, so you know, they break apart. Um, this results in permanent chromosomal breaks. Um, the overall point is that without you know, being able to um, you know, ligate the DNA, we end up with cell lysis and the bacterium dies. Um, fluoroquinolones used to be used a lot, um, but their use has declined a bit lately. Um, and this is for a couple of reasons. Um, one, resistance. We were using them so much for you know, UTIs, for respiratory infections. We were using them really frequently. So resistance has increased um, a, a, quite a bit. Um, resistance has increased. Also, there were some adverse drug effects that we didn't know about when the drugs first came on the market. Um, so for example, like tendon rupture, we did not um, know that they could cause tendon rupture until you know, they were out on the market and post-marketing surveillance. We learned this with post-marketing surveillance. So because of some adverse drug effects, um, they cause QT prolongation too, um, but because of the adverse drug effects and resistance, they're not necessarily first line as much as they used to be. So for a lot of indications, not all, but a lot of indications, they're now second line agents. Um, the spectrum of activity is different in the different fluoroquinolones. Um, so I've got them kind of listed out over here. Um, first off here, C for Cipro. Cipro does not have good gram-positive coverage. Um, it covers anthrax, so we use Cipro for anthrax. Um, but besides that, it lacks gram-positive coverage. Cipro, however, does have good gram-negative coverage. So it covers Pseudomonas, um, H. influenza, E. coli, which is why we use it for UTIs, um, Neisseria, like gonorrhea, Chlamydia, Legionella. Um, <clears throat> so just kind of think of Cipro as good gram negative and anthrax. Um, levofloxacin has a lot of that same coverage as Cipro, but it has additional coverage of staph and strep in mycobacterium. Um, so it, it's more broad spectrum. We add more agents with the levofloxacin. Um, and that good strep coverage, it includes um, strep pneumo. So because of the strep pneumo, we use levofloxacin for respiratory infections, which on the next slide, we'll talk about what we use these for. But we use it for um, respiratory infections like sinusitis or pneumonia. Um, we would also use moxifloxacin there. So levofloxacin and moxifloxacin are what we call respiratory fluoroquinolones. Um, Cipro would not be a respiratory fluoroquinolone. Um, that's more urinary because it does not cover the gram-positive agents that we usually see in respiratory infections. Um, staph coverage, including MSSA, so it does not cover MRSA, but it covers methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. Um, <clears throat> okay, so continuing down. Um, <clears throat> so moxifloxacin, um, gemifloxacin, um, delafloxacin, which these are not all of them. There's other agents too, like ofloxacin, for example. Um, 
but these agents have even more gram positive activity. Um, so the, the, the activity that we saw previously plus even more gram positive activity. Um, there are a couple like caveats and little specifics here. So um, delafloxacin has activity against MRSA, right? So the other agents have activity against MSSA, but um, delafloxacin has activity against MRSA, um, Enterococcus facialis, um, and delafloxacin keeps its pseudomonas coverage. So like we're adding this, this other good gram positive coverage and it's retaining that good um, gram negative coverage. It's including coverage against pseudomonas. Um, the other two do agents here though, so gemifloxacin and moxifloxacin, um, they lose that pseudomonas coverage. Okay, so out of these three right here, um, delafloxacin is the only one that keeps pseudomonas coverage. The other two don't. Um, moxifloxacin and delafloxacin also cover for mycobacteria. Sorry, PowerPoint like updated and I can't make this go to the next slide. Um, all right, so, um, you know, it's good to have knowledge about the spectrum of activity, but this is the really useful part here, right? When do we actually use these agents? Um, so we'll start with anthrax. Um, up here, you see the treatment of anthrax, which if you watch my um, tetracycline video, you know that we can use doxycycline for anthrax. Um, <clears throat> however, in, um, you know, adult patients, ciprofloxacin is the drug of choice for um, anthrax. So this would be for post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you think somebody has come into contact with anthrax, you can use cipro to prevent them from actually you know, becoming sick. Um, and we can use cipro for treatment. Um, so cipro is first line for prophylaxis and treatment of um, anthrax. Um, alternatives are levofloxacin or also um, doxycycline, right? So doxycycline is a good alternative as well as levofloxacin if the patient can't take Cipro for whatever reason. Um, here, urinary tract infections, um, ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin um, are used for UTIs. Um, notice moxifloxacin is not listed there. Um, <clears throat> Cipro is probably used more commonly, um, but both Cipro and Levo can be used for UTIs, right? These are urinary fluoroquinolones, and then both Levofloxacin and Moxifloxacin can be used for respiratory infections, right? So that's kind of how you keep them straight. Um, Moxifloxacin does not, um, does not do well for urinary tract infections. Um, keep in mind, though, these are not first line. Um, <clears throat> we have other agents that we'll talk about towards the end of this lecture that we use first line for urinary tract infections. Um, <clears throat> levofloxacin and moxifloxacin are, again, our respiratory fluoroquinolones. Um, we use these for respiratory infections. Um, keep in mind that ciprofloxacin is not a drug of choice for these um, like respiratory infections caused by strep pneumo because it does not have that good um, gram-positive coverage, um, which strep pneumo is very common in respiratory infections. Um, levofloxacin is first line for community-acquired pneumonia. Okay, so that's a good important thing whenever we have something that's a first line agent. So levofloxacin, a first line agent for community acquired pneumonia, um, which there are multiple agents, um, like we talked about amoxicillin and clavulonic acid, right? Generic augmentin is also a um, option 
for a first line agent for community acquired pneumonia. Um, but now we have another option, so levofloxacin. Um, moxifloxacin can be used too. Um, <clears throat> so moxifloxacin is a, a possible choice for community acquired pneumonia. Um, but we do not use moxifloxacin for hospital acquired pneumonia because remember it does not cover pseudomonas. And um, hospital acquired or nosocomial acquired infections are um, you know, at risk for being caused by pseudomonas. So if it's hospital acquired pneumonia, then levofloxacin um, is going to be better because it covers pseudomonas. Moxifloxacin does not, okay? Um, <clears throat> but moxy could be for community acquired. Um, so gastrointestinal tract infections. Um, so in severe um, acute diarrhea, so like traveler's diarrhea, for example, um, empiric antibiotic use can be indicated. Um, in that case, ciprofloxacin can be used. Cipro is really effective against uh, acute diarrhea uh, that we suspect is being caused by um, bacteria. Um, another option is azithromycin. Um, so if you have a patient, you have to make sure that this is, um, like empiric therapy is, is necessary. A lot of diarrhea does not require antibiotic therapy, but traveler's diarrhea, for example, is one of those scenarios where it's bacterial um, and it you know, does, does require um, or does benefit from antibiotic therapy. So traveler's diarrhea, um, ciprofloxacin or azithromycin are good first line agents. Here's some important kinetic um, features related or kinetic factors related to the fluoroquinolones. Um, first off, administration with cations. So any positively charged ion will reduce the absorption of the fluoroquinolones. This is not a new concept to us. Um, when we looked at the tetracyclines, we saw the same thing, right? Tetracyclines cannot be given with um, you know, dairy or calcium supplements, um, antacids. Same thing with fluoroquinolones. Um, and the reason for this is that um, they, they attach to each other and then the drug does not get absorbed. Um, so it decreases the absorption. Now, if you look at the chart here, you can see the black line is ciprofloxacin taken with water, right? You can see how much gets absorbed. Taken with milk, you can see that the absorption is, is cut down by about, I don't know, 40%, maybe 30%. And then taken with yogurt, it's cut down even a little bit more than that, so probably by about 50%. This is not as extreme as we saw with the tetracyclines, but this is still a really big amount, right? If you take it with yogurt, you're only getting half of the drug absorbed, so that's a big deal. Um, so make sure to counsel your patients that they cannot take fluoroquinolones with anything that has cations. Obviously, your patient's not going to understand what that means, what cations mean, so you need to explain it to them, right? Do not take them with dairy products like milk or yogurt or cheese. Um, <clears throat> do not take them with supplements or vitamins that have um, calcium or iron. Um, other things to avoid are antacids. Um, antacids like Tums or Rolaids because these have either calcium or iron usually like calcium um, carbonate for example. Um, <clears throat> so patients need to be told not to take them with that. Um, most of the fluoroquinolones penetrate tissues and fluids really well including the CSF. Um, the one kind of exception to keep in mind here is moxifloxacin does not penetrate urine. Um, <clears throat> moxifloxacin just gets metabolized by the liver, um, so the active drug does not penetrate urine, which is why we say no moxifloxacin for urinary tract infections. Um, it just doesn't go into the urine. Um, the other agents, however, uh, are cleared by the kidneys, so we need to adjust the doses in renal dysfunction. Um, if there's renal dysfunction, then that means the kidneys are not able to clear the drug out of the system. 
um, so the drug can build up. So you would need to give a lower dose in these patients who have renal dysfunction. Um, <clears throat> Also, we see some drug interactions that occur with a Cipro because Cipro inhibits some Cip enzymes. Um, sorry, Cipro is Ciprofloxacin. So Ciprofloxacin inhibits Cip1A2 and Cip3A4. So you need to be cautious if you are giving Cipro with any drugs that are metabolized by these enzymes. Um, Cip3A4 is pretty common. Uh, it metabolizes a lot of drugs. So there can be quite a few drug interactions here. Um, <clears throat> here you see just a few examples. Um, <clears throat> cyclosporin, um, theophylline, warfarin are all metabolized by these enzymes. So if they're given with Cipro, then we stop the metabolism and the drug itself increases. So this is problematic. Um, you know, warfarin, for example, if you have a patient on warfarin and then you give them ciprofloxacin, um, that warfarin can build up. You'll see an increase in the INR and patient can have bleeding events. Um, other things that we see interacting include um, like zolpidem, which is a, a sleep agent, a hypnotic, um, ropinirole, sildenafil, which we just talked about, sildenafil, uh, which is used for ED, uh, but a lot of possible drug interactions. Fluoroquinolones in general, um, you know, tend to be well tolerated. There are some kind of serious possible adverse drug effects, though, um, that can be worrisome. But in general, in, you know, just like your healthy patients, um, fluoroquinolones that, you know, are, are relatively well tolerated. Um, <clears throat> the most common adverse drug effects that we see are nausea, um, diarrhea, we have, um, so nausea down here, diarrhea, um, <clears throat> headache, dizziness. Um, these are just kind of the most common general adverse drug effects. So there are some CNS effects that are possible. Um, so anxiety, confusion, insomnia, hallucinations, but these things are really rare. These are not common adverse drug effects. Um, there is a black box warning for fluoroquinolones now related to tendon rupture. Um, this is what I was talking about that we saw in post-marketing surveillance. Um, patients who are on fluoroquinolones, there's an increased risk for tendonitis, um, tendon rupture, and then I just mentioned um, peripheral neuropathy and the CNS effects. Again, this is rare, but this is something that you need to be cautious about. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a patient who is a you know a weightlifter for example and like this is or a bodybuilder and they lift really heavy weights and they're not going to stop doing it they're going to train every day it is what it is um, then I would train avoid a fluoroquinolone in that patient right or patients who are you know professional athletes patients who are going to be under you know kind of physical stress um, then I would avoid fluoroquinolones or, you know, counsel that patient that they need to avoid that strenuous activity where they're putting a ton of stress on their tendons while they're taking the fluoroquinolone. Fluoroquinolones are associated with phototoxicity. It's pretty common. Um, tetracyclines, for example, also cause phototoxicity. So counsel your patients while they're on the fluoroquinolone that they need to make sure they wear sunscreen or stay out of the sun, right, cover up. Um, Arthralgias and arthropathy have been reported in pediatric patients. So in general, we try and avoid fluoroquinolones in pediatric patients, except for um, in you know, very specific scenarios or situations. Um, so for example, like children with CF exacerbations we give fluoroquinolones for, um, like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, just your general run-of-the-mill sinusitis in a child um, that's otherwise healthy, I would not give a fluoroquinolone for. Um, <clears throat> hepatotoxicity is, again, you know, rare um, but possible. 
Um, glucose disturbances, again, rare, but possible glucose disturbances, we really just tend to see in diabetic patients on insulin. Um, finally, QT prolongation, so prolongation of the QT, um, the QT interval, that is important. Um, fluoroquinolones do prolong the QT interval. Um, this usually doesn't cause a problem in most otherwise healthy patients, but if you have a patient who already has arrhythmias or is prone to arrhythmias or is on any other medication that also causes QT prolongation, then this can be problematic. Um, and we've covered a lot of drugs this semester that cause QT prolongation. Um, <clears throat> and remember, there are other situations, right, like regarding um, electrolytes, um, so potassium levels, for example, that could make QT prolongation um, more likely. So it is important to look at your patient, um, you know, just look, see, are they on any antiarrhythmics? Are they on any other agents that might cause QT prolongation? And if they are, then I would avoid the fluoroquinolone um, if possible. And always, you know, be cautious. Okay, so that's it for fluoroquinolones. Um, in general, for fluoroquinolones, think Cipro and Levo for UTIs, Levo and Moxy for respiratory infections. Um, Cipro is also used for anthrax. Um, that's kind of the, the general um, short version of fluoroquinolone use. Um, sulfonamides are the next class of drugs that we're going to cover. Sulfonamides include drugs like sulfasalazine, um, silver, sulfadiazine, um, which is also like abbreviated SSD, like to cream, SSD cream, um, sulfamethoxazole as well. Um, sulfonamides work by inhibiting an enzyme that's needed for the bacteria to make dihydrofolic acid. Um, it's, it's a mouthful, dihydroterolate um, synthetase is the specific enzyme that they inhibit. But in general, sulfonamides work by preventing the formation of dihydrofolic acid. Um, so the bacteria can't make folic acid. Um, folic acid is a coenzyme that's needed in order to make RNA. Um, it's needed to make DNA. So for cell division, you need it folic acid. Um, it's needed to make amino acids. So for protein synthesis, for cell growth, like you need folic acid. Um, humans get folic acid from our diet, right? So we have to eat a diet that has enough folic acid in it. Um, but bacteria have to produce their own folic acid. So if we inhibit um, this enzyme, then we inhibit that process. So the bacteria can't grow, it can't repair itself, it can't divide, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple, like there are a couple other types of um, antibiotic that also do this. Um, for example, trimethoprim. Um, trimethoprim blocks this same pathway. So we do combine agents like sulfamethoxazole is combined with trimethoprim. So trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole are usually used together um, and they, they help each other. They help, they have what's called a synergistic effect. They help each other work better um, <clears throat> because they're both kind of blocking that, that same pathway. Um, also, when we, um, we can also combine them with um, pyrimethamine, which you see down here. So sulfadiazine is combined with pyrimethamine, um, and that's actually the preferred treatment for toxoplasmosis. Um, pyrimethamine is another folate antagonist. So the spectrum of activity um, is gram-negative and gram-positive organisms. So broad spectrum of activity, um, including Enterobacter, H. influenza, strep, staph, Macardia. Um, so again, really, really broad spectrum of activity. All right, so the kinetics of sulfonamides. 
Um, <clears throat> the sulfonamides penetrate the CSF, so we can use them for CSF infections. Um, they also cross the placenta. Um, so they cross the placenta, so we do not give them to um, pregnant women who are at term um, or infants, neonates that are less than two years of age. Um, so not women who are about to give birth or really, really young babies. Um, they also can be eliminated in the breast milk, so that's another thing to um, be cautious if the mom's breastfeeding a, um, a neonate. Um, they're all kind of kinetically different. Um, so sulfasalazine is, um, can be given orally, but it's not actually absorbed from the GI tract. So we give it orally and it just stays in the GI tract, but that's actually what we use it for. Um, sulfasalazine is reserved for or just used for um, chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So what happens is this sulfasalazine is given, it remains in the GI tract, and the intestinal flora, they, our bacteria that live in our GI tract, split the sulfasalazine into two different parts. It gets split into sulfapyridine and then 5 amino salicylate. This 5-amino salicylate is an actual anti-inflammatory. So this is how it helps with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the 5-amino salicylate is like delivered right there to the site of action um, and it decreases inflammation in the bowel. Um, the sulfapyridine, this other component right here, um, the sulfapyridine can actually be absorbed then. Um, so the sulfasalazine does not get absorbed, but after it gets broken down, the 5-amino salicylate works right there, but the sulfapyridine can get absorbed. That sulfapyridine then gets, um, gets uh, acetylated right, by the liver and gets cleared. But there's a such thing as being a slow acetylator. In patients who are slow acetylators, um, that sulfapyridine can actually build up and lead to toxicity. So this, um, this should not be used in patients who are slow, like known slow acetylators. Um, silver uh, sulfadiazine, I said that was like called SSD cream, um, is used topically in burn victims. Um, usually the sulfonamides aren't used topically, but this is like one instance where they are. Um, so SSD cream prevents um, burn-related sepsis um, when patients have you know, severe um, burns. There's another agent that is also used topically for burns. Um, it's called mafenide, but it's, it's another sulfa cream, mafenide, um, M-A here. So mafenide is another sulfur cream for burns, but mafenide actually hurts when it's applied. Um, so it's painful when it's applied. Also, it can be absorbed more and it messes with acid-base balance. So if you're comparing mafenide and SSD cream, the silver sulfa diazine SSD cream would be better. Um, Sulfonamides get acetylated by the liver, right? Uh, processed by the liver. Um, <clears throat> but the product um, of that acetylation, it can precipitate in the liver. Uh, I mean, sorry, it can um, precipitate in the urine if it is a neutral or acidic pH. Um, so it's possible to cause crystallaria. Um, which is just stones, right? So there can be stone formation that occurs uh, just from the metabolite, not the drug itself, but the metabolites, uh, which can cause damage to the kidneys. Um, we see the metabolites themselves are eliminated by the kidney, so um, dose adjustment might need to occur in renal failure. Okay, um, <clears throat> so adverse drug effects. Here for crystallaria, right, we can have crystal stones form um, in the urine. Um, so because of that, we can see some nephrotoxicity occur. Um, to prevent this, we encourage hydration. 
So if you have a patient who's you know, prone to this or has experienced this before or is experiencing it, um, we encourage hydration and um, you can alkalinize, alkalinize the urine. Remember we said that the stones form, um, the crystallization happens when the um, pH of the urine is neutral or acidic. So if you um, alkalinize the urine, if you make the pH of the urine more alkaline, then it won't precipitate. The stone won't form. Um, the metabolite will just stay in, in um, solution and it'll get cleared fine. Um, hypersensitivity reactions are relatively common with sulfa antibiotics. Um, and there's a wide range. The hypersensitivity reaction can be mild, you know, just like a light rash all the way to you know, really severe anaphylaxis or Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, there is cross-reactivity between the sulfa antibiotics, so be careful with that. Always make sure you inquire about allergies. Ask the patient if they are allergic to sulfa antibiotics and what that reaction was. Um, hematopoietic um, disturbances are possible. Um, sulfonamides can cause hemolytic anemia, um, hemolytic anemia in patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, so in patients who have glucose, um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. or GP6D, dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, so again, hemolytic anemia can occur in those patients. Um, we also can see thrombocytopenia, um, granulocytopenia. So penia is poverty, right? Like you don't have enough cells. Um, <clears throat> so we can see a decrease in red blood cells, a decrease in platelets, um, a decrease in granulocytes. Um, <clears throat> bilirubin associated brain damage can occur in newborns. Um, this is why we said we do not give uh, sulfonamide antibiotics to babies less than two months or to women who are at term um, because it crosses the placenta. So if the woman is at term and you give her the antibiotic, it's going to cross the placenta and go into the baby and then the baby can be born and have it in their system. And then that can cause the, the brain damage. So not in women at term or babies less than two months. Um, what happens is the, in newborns, the sulfa drug, the antibiotic, kicks the bilirubin off of its binding protein. And that allows the bilirubin to then enter into the central nervous system because at that young age, the blood-brain barrier is usually underdeveloped. Um, <clears throat> so that underdeveloped blood-brain barrier can't kick that bilirubin, or can't keep the bilirubin out of the brain, and bilirubin causes brain damage. So again, no sulfas to infants less than two months or pregnant women at term. Um, so, Sulfamethoxazole, a sulfa antibiotic, and then trimethoprim, which I just mentioned, these are both uh, folate antagonists, right? So they, they both prevent the, the formation or activity of folic acid in bacteria. Um, and they have, again, I said a synergistic effect when they're given together. So um, if you look here, this is just showing you the activity um, of you know, no, so this is like bacterial growth, right? How much, how much the bacteria is growing. Um, with no drug, you see a lot of bacterial growth. Um, and then with trimethoprim alone, you see some bacterial growth. Sulfamethoxazole alone, you see some bacterial growth, right? They're pretty similar. But when you combine the drugs together, there's practically no bacterial growth. So this dark blue line down here is showing you both drugs together. So they work way better together than if you gave either one agent. So we don't ever, I mean, I've never seen just one of these given. Um, it's always together. Um, Bactrim, 
for example, it's called Bactrim or Bactrim DS is Bactrim double strength. Um, that's the combination of sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Um, so we use this, this frequently. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about what the indications for all these sulfa drugs are on the next slide, but you'll very commonly see you know, Bactrim used. Um, adverse drug effects that we see with this combination include um, commonly nausea and vomiting, uh, rash. Again, we still have this hematologic toxic toxicity that's possible. Um, and then we see possible hyperkalemia. For the hyperkalemia, you know, keep in mind if patients are on any other agents that also cause hyperkalemia, um, like ACE inhibitors or um, potassium sparing diuretics, or if you have a patient who's prone to hyperkalemia anyhow, um, just keep this in mind so you avoid drug interactions, you avoid worsening that hyperkalemia. Um, here you see some of the various uses of um, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Uh, there are a lot of names for this, like Bactrim, I just told you, Septra is another brand name. Here, um, the textbook is using co-trimoxazole, co, I think, because like there's two drugs together, um, trimeth, uh, or yeah, like tri, like trimethazole, trimethoprim, and then methoxazole for sulfamethoxazole. Um, so that's that's where that name is coming from. Um, so anytime you see co um, trimethoxazole, it's talking about sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. So um, it can be used for MRSA infections, um, like skin and soft MRSA, skin and soft tissue infections. Um, it can be used in respiratory infections, um, like caused by H influenza, for example. Um, <clears throat> we see that it's effective for listeriosis, so like listeria or meningitis, for example, um, or sep um, sepsis caused by listeria. Um, we see them used a lot in um, prostatitis or urinary tract infections. Um, <clears throat> we can see them used in some gastrointestinal infections as well. This down here is um, an important one. Um, so pneumocystis gervici is a um, opportunistic infection that happens in patients with um, HIV or AIDS. So um, this is the, the most effective therapy. Um, tri sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim is the most effective therapy um, in patients with you know, AIDS who have uh, pneumocystis. Also, we recommend using um, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim prophylaxis in patients with um, AIDS or with HIV who have their CD4 cell count drop to less than 200. Right? So CD4 cells or helper T cells drop to less than 200. We recommend um, prophylaxis with sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Um, it can be used for uh, salmonella. So we do see um, Bactrim used um, or effective in salmonella, which would be one of our GI infections over here. Um, and then also to eradicate the um, S. typhi state, we can see as well. This down here is a big one though. Um, and then we do see it commonly for, for respiratory infections and for MRSA too. So we'll finish these last, um, the last two slides of this presentation are talking about urinary tract antiseptics. So agents that are used, you know, specifically to kill bacteria in the, in the urinary tract. Um, UTIs, urinary tract infections, are one of the most common infections. Uh, especially in women, um, and then also in the elderly. So no matter where you are, you're going to see UTIs. Um, <clears throat> historically speaking, fluoroquinolones like Cipro um, and trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, which we just saw, Bactrim, um, historically those are our first line agents that we would use for UTIs. Um, <clears throat> However, um, as well as Macrobid the, or Macrodantin, which I'm about to talk to you about. 
those are like the general agents we use. But resistance is increasing a lot with fluoroquinolones. Um, and then also with um, Bactrim, resistance is increasing. So we have a couple other agents that um, we, we can use instead um, so that we can kind of stop this, this resistance. Um, these urinary tract antiseptics can be used for suppression um, of recurrence or for treatment. So, you know, we can use them in patients to try and prevent urinary tract infections if they get them really frequently. Um, or we can also use them for treatment of urinary tract infections that already exist. So first, um, we have methenamine. So methenamine is actually an OTC product here in the United States. It's an over-the-counter product. Um, patients can just, you know, go purchase it at Walgreens or Publix or whatever. Um, the brand Azo is a brand that sells um, phenazopyridine. So, um, Phenazopyridine is not an antibacterial agent, but phenazopyridine is used um, for urinary pain and the frequency that happens with the UTI. This is also over the counter. So frequently, um, you know, when a patient has a UTI, they'll go buy this phenazopyridine, which again, Azo is the brand that makes it, um, and that will help them feel better. Um, for a period of time, but it's not killing the bacteria. So they need to make sure that they get some sort of an antiseptic or antibiotic to, to kill the bacteria. Otherwise, they've numbed their urinary tract, um, but the bacteria is just growing and growing and getting worse and worse and worse, and it can progress to you know, pyelonephritis, right? It can move up and they can have a kidney infection. So patients you know, need to make sure that they're, they're taking care of the infection, not just numbing the urinary tract. So the same company that, that sells this phenazopyridine, um, they also sell like cranberry tablets, um, and then they sell methenamine. Methenamine does actually kill the bacteria. Right? Um, this is the only over-the-counter agent that, that really does kill the bacteria. So the way methenamine works is methenamine um, you know, goes into the urine, it's excreted into the urine, and it gets converted into ammonia and formaldehyde. Now this only happens in acidic urine. So the urine has to be acidic in order for this to work. So um, like frequently this will be combined with some sort of a weak acid to make sure that the urine is acidic enough. Um, <clears throat> the formaldehyde kills the bacteria. So um, this methenamine can be used for um, suppressive therapy. Um, so it can be used chronically um, in order to try and decrease the number of um, urinary tract infections that a patient is getting. Um, so patients can take methenamine on a, you know, a daily basis in order to um, you know, decrease UTIs. Um, it does have to be taken multiple times daily, so that is kind of a pain. Um, it has been shown to be somewhat effective, too, if a patient takes it right when they feel like they're first getting symptoms, or um, if the patient commonly gets a postcoital UTI, so like after sex, they get a urinary tract infection. Um, if they take this, you know, for a couple days after sexual activity, it can decrease the likelihood of them getting a UTI. Um, <clears throat> Um, so adverse drug effects. Um, GI distress is most common. Um, we can see some albuminuria or um, hematuria, rashes at really high concentrations. There are a couple different types of methenamine. Um, methenamine mandolate is contraindicated in renal insufficiency, um, but there is another version of it. Um, methenamine, it's Hypurate, methenamine hypurate, um, that version of it can be used in renal insufficiency, and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> they, methenamine cannot be combined with sulfonamides. Um, that is important. So the sulfonamide antibiotic will react with formaldehyde, 
um, and that increases the risk of crystal formation. Um, and it decreases the effectiveness of the sulfonamide because the sulfonamide is joining up with the methanamine um, and it's not working. So this should not be combined with a sulfonamide antibiotic. Right? So it's, they're, they're not working better together. Um, the last one here is nitrofurantoin. Um, nitrofurantoin is, that's what I was talking about when I said macrobid or macrodantin. Um, those are the brand names. The, the drug name is nitrofurantoin. Um, this inhibits DNA and RNA synthesis in the bacteria. Um, nitrofurantoin is first-line therapy for uncomplicated cystitis. So if a patient, you know, uncomplicated patient has a UTI, this would be a good first-line agent um, because we don't see resistance with this. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't see a lot of resistance, so it's usually effective. Um, and that's probably because we don't use this for other conditions. Um, we don't prescribe nitrofurantoin for other stuff. So, you know, we're not seeing unnecessary use and unnecessary resistance developing. Um, <clears throat> if this is not effective um, or you need a second line agent, then, you know, then you can go to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or, uh, you know, ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. Um, adverse drug effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, very rarely we can see pulmonary fibrosis, um, neuropathy, autoimmune hepatitis. Um, this is rare though. So this is more likely with prolonged exposure. Um, like if this were being taken daily for suppressive therapy or you know, to prevent UTIs, then um, that would increase the likelihood. So exposure more than one month increases the likelihood of the neuropathy, the fibrosis, et cetera. Um, this also increases if there's impaired renal function. So um, we do not give, so contraindicated in patients with impaired renal function. Because we don't want to increase the likelihood of, you know, pulmonary fibrosis occurring or neuropathy, hepatitis, etc. Okay, that is it for this one, guys. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions.